Welcome aboard, all you wonderful groomers, pet stylists, and canine cosmetologists. You found the Traveling Groomers Podcast, where we discuss lessons learned from mobile and house call grooming. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Bear Anthony. Any moment now, we'll be joined by my co-host and friend, retired mobile groomer and educator extraordinaire, Mary Aquendo, and very likely a special guest to help us chat about all things grooming, grooming industry related, and just plain fun digressions that I will totally wrangle back to topic. Grab those travel mugs and climb aboard to see where today's topic will bring us. Let's roll. So welcome to another episode of the Traveling Groomers Podcast. So we do have a very special guest today. Woohoo! Woohoo! And that is Michael Shikashio. Did I say that correctly? Perfectly. Awesome. That's why I made Mary say it. <laughs> yeah, she was, I'm sitting here waiting. She's not going to introduce him. I'm uh-uh. gonna... <laughs> Cause I Because as, as the opening was playing, I'm going over it in my head and I'm like, he just explained very perfectly how to pronounce it and I'm <laughs> going to mess it up. So... Mike, I bet you didn't know you had fans in the grooming industry. I did not. Because that's how we got your name. One of our listeners <clears throat> said, oh, get Mike from the Bitey End of the Dog podcast. So well, I'm like, oh, I'm Googling it now. Let's go. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're so glad that you're here. And you know what? Had an opportunity to go up to your website. And I highly recommend your website. Okay. And what I did, I just simply Googled the bitey end of the dog. There you were. So anyway, the, uh, I read a couple of the articles, which I really want to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. Right. But first Chris has to do the episode number. Oh, I have. It's very important. I get stressed if I do it at the end of the episode. I'm it's a, it's a bad brain thing, but Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode number 241, recorded on December 20th, and will be airing on January 3rd. Happy New Year, everybody. All right. Before we even get started, why did you do why did you do a podcast? I love podcasts. I think it's such a great way to get education when you could just be like driving over to the supermarket. I first of all, I want to say I'm impressed with the number of podcasts you guys have recorded because that's a lot <laughs> coming from the podcasting world. I mean, that's a lot. And also impressed with the turnaround time that you can get it out so quickly. So that's because, you guys. That's because our editing team. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe and I need to talk to my editor about uh, that. Editing mm-hmm. team. Okay. She, the non-editing team. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. no, that's great. That's wonderful that you've done so many. That, that says a lot about <laughs> your listeners and how good of a podcast it is. So congratulations on that. I thank uh, you. So why did you start the, that podcast in the first place? Yeah. You know what? It was somebody nudged me to do it. Um, I'll give a credit. Sarah McManaman is a colleague of mine and she's a trainer, a brilliant trainer. And uh, she helps me run the Muzzle Up Project, which is a whole, which is a whole nother initiative. But it's, uh, she's like, why don't you do a podcast? I'm like, podcast? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, that's like a lot of time and effort. And you got to sit down and record things and find guests. So I was like kind of hesitant at first. Uh, but I'm really glad I did it. I, I can't believe the response it got. You know, this will be the fifth season coming up next year, and it's just been going steady and and taken off in ways I never thought of. So, um, and it's a, it's really focused. It's on aggression in dogs. I mean, it's a podcast that is on dogs, which a lot of people listen to, but then it's on behavior. You get a smaller audience, and then it's on aggression, which is even a smaller audience. But for whatever reason, it's it's one of the top podcasts in the world now, and on uh, in the education space. So, you know, go figure. <laughs> niche niche podcasts are the way to go. Yeah, they are, yeah. certainly are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because so, all right. One thing that we did not cover in the opening: you cannot just drop a project. And then not tell us about it. So what is the, yeah, the muzzle re- up project? I already wrote that down up here. Yeah, me, up. yeah. <laughs> me too. So what is muzzle up? Oh, muzzle up project. That is uh, an advocacy site for people that are le- want to learn more about using muzzles for dogs and why we'd use them. Um, and that they're not evil, Hannibal Lecter, mouth closing kind of things that we use on dogs. Because there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of different questions that come up when it comes to why should I muzzle my dog or do I does my dog need a muzzle? Which muzzle should I pick? And so uh, the website is 
chock full of videos on how to comfortably acclimate your dog, how to pick the right muzzle, what kind of muzzle you would need situations for. And I'm sure you guys probably use them quite often in your line of work. So uh, it's, yeah, it's a free website. I took it over from Maureen Backman uh, several years ago. She was a trainer as well. And she ran it. She's the founder of it. And she asked me, you know, you want to take this over because I'm going into a different field? I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. And I was all over it. I was like, yeah, right up my alley. So it's, um, yeah, it's just a free website that's available to anybody. It's full of information and that's all it is. It's an advocacy site for helping dogs that need muscles. Right. So the the website is muzzleupproject.com? Muzzleupproject.com, yep. Nice. Oh, very easy. Okay. And, yeah, and we, we love our muzzles. We we do. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. you you can you can 100% laugh at one of my preferred muzzles because as house call a lot of times i'm grooming the dog when the owners are right there watching <clears throat> and even now i'm doing some in my home salon the owners are welcome to stay cuz i'm used to that so it's that misconception of what muzzles are and they kind of can see when that their dog is biting at me but i've got those plastic duck muzzles Oh, those are awesome. (laughs) Because have you seen those silly Mm -hmm. things? I've seen just about every kind out there. Because (laughs) I can joke to the owner that, oh, I'm going to turn you into a duck. And I go like, you're a duck. And it it helps their brain handle it because it's funny. (laughs) <laughs> Definitely. It softens the image, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. why some of the companies now, like Trust Your Dog is a, is a great company that makes biothane muzzles and they're all these different colors and you can choose yeah. what colors you want. They, so it doesn't have that ominous look on uh, that that some of the other types of muzzles. That old, old fashioned big basket yeah. muzzles that, yeah, that looks yeah. like these Hannibal Lecter things. Yeah. So why not soften the look and help, you know, people, you know, just destigmatize them a little bit, right? So I Love use... It. Well, I'm going to say during um, when I'm teaching the first aid class, the I do make a joke about the Hannibal Lecter look because for dogs that have the pushed in faces, mm-hmm. getting muzzles on them can be really difficult. Yeah. yeah. So I would take a basket muzzle and put it over the entire head of the pet. Mm-hmm. The pet mm-hmm. can breathe. You know, yeah. <laughs> this is what we call the Hannibal Lecter look. So it's a joke. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they have actually muzzles for the brachycephalic breeds too, even that that are just what you're talking about. Almost like cat muzzles, like the cat muzzles. Yeah, like yeah. Just the eye holes. Uh, so here's a funny story too, is that I was at a workshop. I was giving a presentation once in in Providence and um, I didn't, you know, I at this time I was like exploring and researching all the different muzzles out there. And I stated to the audience, like, I have a muzzle fetish. And it just came out oh, like no. totally the wrong way. And people just started dying laughing because I said that. I'm like, that's not what I meant. I mean, like, I, not, I, I, I love- Let us not bring furries into this. Yes. No, not. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know muzzles. Like, I know the different brands. Like, I've spent a lot of time researching the different brands. But yeah, so I have like, I've seen every kind, like the, the duck muzzles. And then the opposite, they have like these really scary looking, like almost like Halloween costume muzzles for dogs. Oh, yeah, with the, with the teeth painted out. on them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then for, for the breakies Falcons, they actually have like a full face covering. Now, obviously, that's going to make it harder for you guys to do any kind of- grooming up at the top end but um, they are pretty safe and fairly breathable that's another thing you look for you want to make sure the dog can actually breathe especially if it's a brachycephalic right you want them to be able to get air so some muzzles aren't appropriate depending on the situation but yeah um so and i i also in one of the episodes i was listening to earlier Mm -hmm. It was the one on small dogs and aggression. And they talked about just taking out a bar so that if you're using it during training, you can still treat them. Yes. And I'm like, that's brilliant. They can't bite you, but you can slip cookie in there. Yeah. There's so many muzzle hacks you can do. Like I actually just, I'll show you you right now. I just had a company send me um, Bark Pouch, which is this company here. They sent me a bunch of samples and these are really cool because you just twist off the top and the dog can look at it. So if you want to do muzzle acclimation and training, or even a distraction technique for, for a grooming procedure, a veterinary exam or something, great product because these are stuffed with real food. Like this isn't garbage processed stuff. They like, it's made in, um, I think Ohio and they just put real food in there and, it's great because the dog's licking at it rather than right. a treat that they eat. And then they turn on like, are you are those scissors next to my head? You know, so it, the lickables are much more efficient for keeping a dog distracted and creating a positive experience with like a, any kind of husbandry handling, grooming, veterinary procedure. Right. So, uh, yeah, we, things like that. So you can even make your own out of, you know, squeeze tubes and stuff. 
I needed, I needed that once upon a time. We had one of the corporate shops I worked at. We had this bulldog. It was either a bulldog or a bulldog type with, you know, those real underbites. Mm -hmm. And the only way we could get his nails done is if one person did his nails and one person just fed him cookies, just mm -hmm. kept him a hundred percent. And we called that underbite his, uh, his cookie tray. And <laughs> yeah. he, it was so intense that if he dropped one, we had to back off until he got another one mm -hmm. in his mouth. Yeah. Cause so if that, he dropped one, yeah. he would remember somebody is touching my feet. I must go eat their soul now. Yes. Yeah. Good. So though that's why the lickables are so great because yeah. it just keeps the dog so focused on it. And those things, most dogs die for them because they're just stuffed with like the best, you know, sardines and cream cheese and turkey and liverwurst and beef and all kinds of good stuff. So. <laughs> all right. Cause you know what? Cause girls, you could take that, maybe get one of those little things that you can stick to, like we got the stuff sticking up on the walls and stick it to the bar for the, yeah. the loop. All right. So you keep them focused right there mm -hmm. at the loop where the, where the bar is the grooming loop, grooming arm. Yeah. And See, this is new with Zoom. So I show my hand and the little hand goes up in there in the corner. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna try that. <laughs> now we're gonna yeah, it's, it's the raising your hand. It sometimes All happens. Right. It sometimes doesn't. And it makes us insane. <laughs> you know, so, so, and there we go. Stun. Put your hand down. Anyway, you put it on the groomer's, the, the, the groomer's arm. It's been four mm -hmm. years since I've been a groomer. So I'm like I'm forgetting terms <laughs> now at this point. Um, so you put it on the groomer's arm and you can let the dog lick it while you're doing what it is you need to do. It's a distraction. And yeah. it's way better than what we saw a couple of years ago with someone putting saran wrap around their head and putting oh, yeah. butter. Yeah. Did that did that make you cringe as badly? As yeah, it made that us that uh, that made us trainers cringe as well as, okay. as, as okay. the groomers. Good. So yeah, it was oh it was cringe worthy across. Okay, you know, across disciplines. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were thinking, oh, someone's getting their face bit yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. So but anyway, oh wait, it is time for our first commercial break. We got we got distracted and good stuff. So this is why this is why sometimes we run over. But we will be back in 30 seconds. Okay, you know I love my evolution swivel shears, and you even know that these customizable shears come in non-swivel as well. But did you know that they're the only ones I've been trusting my sharpening with for around 15 years? And that's how we met. What? You haven't tried their sharpening yet? If so, send in your next batch of sharpening and you'll get one shear sharpened for free with a $75 order just for telling them where you heard about them. Your shears and blades will thank you. All righty. <laughs> okay. In case that, you that'll happen yeah. about four more times. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sold okay. already. <laughs> so I'm, I'm reading your articles. Well, mm -hmm. not your articles, the articles that other trainers have put in there. So the first one I read caught my attention because, you know, the whole alpha role thing, which as a groomer, so again, now I've got probably at this point, if I start from the day, 20 plus years ago, mm -hmm. and I was taught, okay, mm -hmm. do the alpha role. I need to be boss. All right. Um, I also kind of credit that working by myself because, you know, the alpha role didn't really work very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, didn't know why it was supposed to, but it didn't. <clears throat> um, and I had to learn better ways of working with the animals and the alpha role was not it. So I was glad to see more articles coming up on something that is, was for a really long time, the norm in, in the pet industry. Mm -hmm. I don't see it nearly as much, which is, which is good. Um, but in that article, all right. Um, let me just backtrack a little bit. So Many, many years ago, I had a shepherd Malamute mix. She was a big girl. She was the only girl in the house. And she was definitely in charge. But I never got like alpha vibes off of her. Mm -hmm. But in that article, it said, wouldn't a better term be like matriarch rather than an alpha? And when I think back on Kira, that is how I view her, that she was the matriarch of all the other dogs in the house. And I thought that made so much better sense than like referring to her as, as the alpha dog, you know, she, but she was like, a, she was definitely in charge. She was mom. Okay. 
and all the dogs listen to her. <laughs> so I like, I really like that article. So, so the alpha role for those who, who don't know what it is, maybe we don't explain it to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, sure a lot of people have seen it. It at least people have been with working with dogs for a while. You're right though. It has, it thankfully hasn't been making the mainstream of some of the other techniques that are out there, but um, are like it used to. So that's a good thing that people are stepping away and realizing that that's that whole thing came out of a misconception of the original study of alpha yeah. and wolves study. And so it's, yeah, it's good to see that that's going away, but it still is unfortunately um, used in dog training. You know, I don't know how much it is seeped into the grooming world or maybe it's coming out, but it's like, people still want to be the boss. People still feel like they have to dominate the dog for the dog to listen when really we should be doing the opposite and we should be really considering what we can do to help the feel, dog feel more comfortable because that behavior is born out of often they're just not feeling safe or they're feeling stressed or uncomfortable with the environment they're in, not because they're trying to dominate us or trying to be alpha or something mythical like that. It's right. so, so, uh, you know, it's good that we're getting away from that and move much to much more kinder, gentler methods. I, 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 I won't tell you some of the things I was told when I first started grooming that fortunately I only heard once or twice and it was kind of already being phased out 20 years ago, but mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was, it was very, very much a thing. But one of the questions I had for you, because I was like, I'm going to listen to a bunch of episodes and be so prepared. And all it did was make me go, what? I need all the questions. <laughs> so <laughs> I was impressed at the, the intense scientific background on a lot of your podcasts and a lot of the guests. So my question is, because I had to Google and learn a new word. Do you consider yourself an animal behaviorist, a trainer, or an ethologist? That's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that, actually. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Good job, I, Chris. Yeah, I think it's it's because there's there's a lot of different terms for the jobs people are doing in the training mm -hmm. behavior world. And you know, there's no agreed upon standard definition. The only one that's kind of regulated is veterinary behaviorist. Like you can't just call yourself a veterinary behaviorist. And even if you are a veterinarian, you can't say you're a veterinary behaviorist. You're a more board certified veterinary behaviorist. That's the kind of protected term. But that being said, anybody can go out and say they're a behaviorist. Like somebody that just watched an episode of the dog whisperer can go out tomorrow and be like, hand out business cards. I'm a dog behaviorist, right? So it's not a unfortunately protected term. The standard agreed upon definition for most trainers that are in the know is that a behaviorist is someone with an advanced degree. So PhD or master's degree level, uh, usually is what's uh, considered a certified applied animal behavior. So something that's through the animal behavior society or an as associate certified applied animal behavior. So somebody with an advanced degree is usually who we refer the term behaviors for, at least in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and then cons behavior consultant is what I would consider myself as somebody that as you know, consults with clients on behavior issues for their dog. And then trainers, a little bit more universal. I, I can consider myself a trainer. Our behaviors could consider themselves a trainer. But it's basically somebody that's teaching a dog skills, whether they're working with clients or not. They can work with clients to teach, help them teach their dog, or they can just work you know, with the dogs, like a service dog trainer, you know, that kind of thing. So there's unfortunately no unique category that applies to everybody that says, okay, you are definitely this. There's a lot of crossover there. So to answer your question, I consider myself a dog behavior consultant, which is actually okay. the, the certification I've earned as a certified dog behavior consultant. And there's a organization called the IAABC, which does that. And I'm sure you guys have something similar in your world that uh, gives people- We're not going there. Oh, <laughs> I, um, yeah. And you don't have perhaps, to, because I get it. It's the same in the dog training space. It is all kinds of like who thinks they're right about what. And it's all we like, could, we could spend the next hour just, yeah. I, let's yeah. just say no. It's, it's the same exact thing in the dog training. Yeah. So, yeah, I get it. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's not talk about the government trying to come in and license <laughs> us yeah. either. And, and hmm, anyway, Mary, you had another question. Yes. So um, I was also read the article on why basically little dogs are the way they are. So I currently have all little dogs in my house. 
Mm -hmm. right? And at one time I had nothing but big dogs in my house. And you know what? They, I honestly, I think big dogs and little dogs really should be two separate species. Okay. (laughs) Um, But I think part of that is the way we view them. Okay. mm -hmm. Because, you know, my big dogs, oh no, there's no accidents in my house. Okay. Because if the big one pees, it's a lake. Okay. And so I I think house training is more, this is going to get done. Okay. Um, But with sometimes with smaller dogs, it's, you know, I don't want to hurt the dog. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. they're little. I mean, I have watched my four male dogs go outside, pee 14 times a piece, come in the house and go head over to the chair leg. Yeah. And and Mary, are we going to have a chest bursting incident? Oh yeah, yeah. hold on a second. Are you gonna are you gonna warn him about this? Okay, wait, 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 wait. Don't worry, this is not going where you think it's going. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm sure there's some. There's got to be a chihuahua in there. Oh, it's close. Boo boo. Here's Pooh Bear. Oh. Uh, and since we're talking okay. about small dogs, I thought I should totally warn you because there have been times where a bug farts outside and a guest doesn't know he's in there and he goes blah, blah, and you know gives us heart attacks it's <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me though i'm i'm, I'm just, it wouldn't be a podcast about animals if there wasn't a dog barking in the background so yeah, you yeah have the that. other one is is sleeping yeah. so i have specific questions about two of my dogs okay yeah and and when after i read the article one of the things really really made sense to me because you know what i don't you don't I had a golden retriever. I didn't just scoop him up and put him someplace. Okay. If I wanted him to go someplace, it was like, Hey, Rick, let's go move. Okay. So I'm asking him to move. I'm not picking him up and moving him, but these little guys, I have, I could pick this guy up. He doesn't think twice of it. I have another little dog. I could pick up this and think twice of it. The third one. Yeah. He's not too thrilled about it. Cecil. Okay. Cecil has a real issue with it. Okay. And you know what? Not looking at it from his perspective. Um, he is diabetic. He's got glaucoma, so he doesn't see very well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Most of the time I'm picking him up at least twice a day, he's getting a shot that's associated with being picked up. All right. He won't do the stairs. And I think that annoys him that I have to pick him up so he can go down the stairs. All right. So picking him up is I've learned that instead of just going and grabbing him to pick him up, I pick him up on his own terms. Okay. Which is resulted in a lot less bites for me. All right. He's less aggravated, but you know what? And I read it in the article. I mean, I just didn't occur to me that, you know what? Yeah. I would never just pick just, up a large just- loom over them right we don't just go to large dogs even when we have to lift them for something to get them in the tub we're like okay hand on collar it's it's a slower process we're not just wink yep. and like mm-hmm. fling them up in the air and expect them to be cool <laughs> yeah so Uh-oh. it was nice it was nice to read that that like, you know what yeah i mean so it really validated how how good the information mm-hmm. is on your site And I have to admit, I am also totally guilty of not taking small dog aggression seriously in certain small dogs. Like, no, if it's a shizu and I have to trim their face, I am taking them deadly seriously. But if it's a little old Chihuahua or Pomeranian that they're, those are just breeds that I, that I love. And something about a little old Pom that looks at you and like, and I'm like, oh, you're still so cute. I'm still going to yeah. snuggle you. And I'm like, no, I shouldn't. Yeah, that's a good thought process. Because we do want to think about the little ones and what they're going through, even though, you know, because it's what society does to us. Like we look at small dogs and we're like, oh, that's cute. Or that's funny when a small dog growls. But if we just interchange that small dog with, you know, 130 pound Connie Corso, that's doing the same thing. We wouldn't be laughing as much. 
or or you know if we go even a step forward what if all dogs weighed as much as a horse and and you had the strength to like pick up a horse or you barely you know like think about like how that horse would feel about being picked up right off the ground when they've never experienced it so like mm -hmm. larger dogs they hardly ever get picked up they don't get that experience whereas smaller dogs they kind of get desensitized to it early on they tolerate us some of them will actually like it because they get the reinforcement of attention from their person or the warmth <laughs> that they get, you know, being under somebody's from sweater. So there's some reinforcement history yeah. too, right? So they they actually get, they they learn that it's a good thing and a good outcome usually, but some of the small dogs actually can be a scary outcome. So it's sometimes we forget that as a society, I think just a general society, like we think of when we see small dogs on social media and everybody's laughing at the Chihuahua, but nobody's laughing at like that Great Dane or that German Shepherd that's growling in somebody's face. So um, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. And probably you guys see the same thing too, like with the small dogs you're grooming there, sometimes going to be much more apt to be picked up or not. It's like you should point on the end of the other, but it, you, if you go look at their behavior history and what they've experienced, it'll tell you why you're seeing that now, typically. And it's usually the ones that are having a tough time. It's through a culmination of bad experiences from being picked up, small children picking up and squeezing the dog or somebody scary, Uncle Bob coming over. It's like, oh, what a cute chihuahua. And the dog's never seen Uncle Bob and comes over and picks up the dog, scares the dog. And then pretty soon the dog's like, I hate when people pick me up, including whoever else is going to pick me up in the future. And that could be a groomer or a veterinarian or somebody else. So um, that behavior history and the social influences, it's its really interesting to see just how much people can change the dog's behavior over time like that. All right, I've got a scenario for you. Wait, the hold that thought. <laughs> hold that thought because I have to I have to do a thing again. And 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 then we'll be back. Buy those shears. I oh, love get those being shears a house called groomer, but I hate doing laundry or worrying about asking my clients for fresh towels. Ray Pet has solved those problems for me with the Wet Pet disposable towel, taking up much less space than traditional cotton towels and easy to wring out and reuse. These super soft, comfy, absorbent towels eliminate any cross contamination concerns between pets, and now their new smaller washcloth size can even help those sensitive eye areas. Great for cleaning out wrinkles gently and thoroughly. Need to keep water bowls for your clients on hand that are easy to disinfect, but hate all the room traditional clanky metal bowls take up or just have a very active pet? Their collapsible silicone bowl comes with an aluminum D-ring hook that can be attached to your pet's leash or anywhere else in your van for easy storage. You can get one by itself or in their handy travel kit along with a set of three tick removers and one small wet pet towel. So stop by their website to check it out, raypet.net, and tell them the traveling groomer sent you. Yeah, those towels are actually pretty awesome. <laughs> All right, so this is the scenario. Yeah. All right, so back I had three dogs at the time. One was Shakira, she was the Shepherd Malamute. I had, and she was easy, 135 pounds. She was a big dog. Um, then there was Sammy. He was a pit bull mix. He was about 70. And then baby, the Chihuahua, who was probably about six pounds. Okay. So the dogs are outside one day and the property next to me, they're putting in a septic system. So they got the big machinery, really large men. Okay. And I would say Kira and Sammy are barking respectively from a distance. Like, yo, we're here. You're there. You stay there. Oh, but not baby. Baby was ready to go in for the kill. What would you tell me about my little dog? So you, you mentioned three dogs there. Yes. Baby okay. was the Chihuahua. Okay. So Shepherd Malamute and then a Pitbull mix mm -hmm. and then baby. So two really big dogs yeah. and one tiny dog. Yeah. Uh, the tiny dogs don't know they're tiny sometimes. <laughs> they are, you know, when it comes to, especially when it comes to dog, dog, um, you know, aggression or dog, dog conflicts is that you will often see that small dog not realize that, Hey, all oh, other no, dogs no, this, was, this wasn't against the other two dogs. This oh, okay. was, he was ready to go after the guys in the uh, oh, gotcha. property. Okay. All right. So I'm thinking this dog's got, got, I don't know, Maybe he's going to be up for a Darwin Award. <laughs> yeah. No, it again doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You know, they they will if they perceive a threat. I mean, when you think about it, that kind of response to anyone of any size 
humans or other species, dogs, elephants, anything, you know, the response is normal because we value our safety. So whether it's a small dog or, you know, two ton elephant, it's going to, you're going to see an aggressive response if they're feeling threatened enough, because that's the one misconception about aggression is like, it's a bad thing. Like my dog is biting or snapping and can't have that. But it's almost like saying my dog is breathing or they're blinking their eyes. It's just normal. It's normal behavior, normal responses to things in the environment. In fact, if we didn't have aggression or fear or some of the other things that help us stay safe, we wouldn't survive long. So imagine if, you know, people start attacking you like, oh, I'm not going to have any aggressive response. I'm not going to protect myself. I'm not going to push you away. I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to do any of those things because it's taboo in our society. Imagine that. So it wouldn't work for you very long. You, you wouldn't survive long. So same thing for little dogs. You often see that, you know, response with gusto because <laughs> it works for them you know they learn what works too like they might have happened in the past and little ones like you know i know what to do to scare these people away and i got my my backup too that's another thing to consider too is something called social facilitation it's when um well sort of when we see dogs back each other up but they also do it in a way that they're just engaging in the same behavior so when you hear like the ups driver pull up and one dog starts barking the other dogs start barking that's social facilitation um, and in some cases they can work as a team to accomplish the same task. Okay. So drive that... off the UPS driver because they exactly. barked, he left victory. It works. And they practice it how many times a year, especially yeah. this time of year when <clears> packages <throat> are being delivered. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So the little Chihuahua again, so let's go mm -hmm. a couple of years. And now I have six dogs, all of which okay. are on my bed sleeping with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And baby decides it's really crowded here. So he jumps off the bed, he runs over to the living room, starts barking, and the next thing you know, five dogs are running to the living room to bark their full heads off. He comes walking back, gets back up in the bed and says, you can almost hear him say suckers. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting thing because my lab actually did that to my Doberman a bunch of times. So she would bark like something was at the door. Doberman would be like, I'm a Doberman, I'm going to go protect the house. And she'd be like, ah, and then she would come back to bed. So it's like, it's a learned behavior. They learn that it works. I don't think dogs are quite that smart where they're like, all right, if I do this, I can get all the dogs off the bed. I think through learning history from some other incident where maybe another UPS person was there and the dog's like, wait, if I go there, it resulted in those dogs leaving the bed. So maybe I'll try that again in the future. So I don't think they're thinking of it ahead of time, like a chess move. But I do think that <laughs> once it happens, they're like, ah, that worked for me. So I could be very, very much what happened in your case. Okay. And I had teenage daughters at the time. There was no sneaking into my house <laughs> at all. Yeah. Nice. Oh, well that, but that means that doesn't mean that the second or a third or whatever, how many times down the road that there was nothing there, I mean, the behavior can just be there. There's like, okay, I'm going to, um, because the, there's always a trigger in the environment that sets a yeah. behavior in motion. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the UPS person. It could be that, all right, the antecedent, what's called the antecedent arrangement is here where I want the other dogs off the bed. So how do I do that? It's the behavior I'm motivated to do that. So I know what behavior works to do that. So it's main have been that nobody was there dog was just smart enough to say i know it works to get this and i can do it without conflict of trying to take on five large dogs <laughs> to kick them off the bed <laughs> okay so you also made up a really good point is is you know dogs have to communicate with us and sometimes that aggressive behavior is how they communicate with us you know what yeah. i need you to stop doing this mm -hmm. all right and i need you forcefully telling you to stop doing this because if you don't stop doing this i'm going to bite you mm -hmm. all right um i was a mobile dog groomer so there was limited room for me to back up and i did large dogs too mm -hmm. so if i have an aggressive dog i only have two feet to back up from this dog i don't have an entire shop nor do i have anybody else in there to help me Right. So learning to pay attention to the dogs telling us mm -hmm. that this is a problem and to respect that. Right. And Chris's house call kind of almost like the same deal. Mm -hmm. Not I'm, I'm in their turf. Yeah. I'm, I'm in their territory. Right. So we hear lots of different things. All right. And there was like something that I was like, I read about and I was like, oh my God, I would never do that. And then I talked to other people and I'm like, maybe that's not a bad idea. Okay. Um, and it was to do with 
um, it was actually Shannon Walker, uh, Northeast Northwest Battle Buddies, and she trains dogs for PTSD for vets. Mm -hmm. So they have some serious dogs there. All right, they got shepherds. Mm -hmm. Most of their dogs are shepherds. I think they got goldens and labs as well too. But I had run this by her. Right. So the thing is that somebody did a, like a YouTube video or a TikTok or whatever that you should have like a lead in your pocket all the time so that if a dog attacks another dog, you could choke the dog out mm -hmm. to get the dog from killing the other dog or killing a person or, or whatever. OK. And when I first saw that, I was actually mortified. That 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 you would do something like that. Mm -hmm. What is your take on that? So uh, it's describing an emergency scenario to me. Yeah, so, an emergency situation. Yeah. So if somebody is like being attacked or if it's a dog-dog fight and the other dog's latched on and not letting go, that's actually one of the techniques I teach in my what's called the defensive handling and emergency handling workshops uh, to dog trainers mostly, but to veterinarians and groomers and dog daycare and shelter staff uh, for the emergency scenarios. So it sounds like such an awful thing to do to a dog. Like, oh my gosh, you would choke a dog out or you wrap a dog, a leash around a dog's neck to choke them. Obviously, that's not something we're going to do to teach a dog how to sit or, you know, <laughs> greet them at home with, right? It is for emergencies only. So when somebody's being attacked. And so I actually, that is one of a variety of tools and techniques I would approach and use for, again, emergencies. I, I always, I even state that in my workshop. I stress the word emergencies when somebody is at imminent threat of, you know, harm or the other dog is being, you know, attacked and hurt. So you see what classes I don't see at the trade shows. Okay. We see behavior classes, you know, mm -hmm. how to read dog behavior, how to read yep. cat behavior. But what I don't see is, is that type of thing being taught at the trade shows. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There are very busy shops. All right. There are shops that are doing 30, 40 dogs a day. Yep. They have multiple groomers. Dogs are walking back and forth. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm thinking that maybe groomers should be taking such a class for that emergency situation, all right? Yeah. Not that they're going to use it every time a dog makes a funny face at them, but, you know, something that should be in their back pocket. I think anybody working with dogs or with things with sharp teeth should know the emergency handling. And I, I talk about this all the time in all of my workshops is that it's really under-recognized in our industry. So when I say industry, I mean groomers, daycare, trainers, veterinarians, anybody working with dogs, animal control. Um, the issue is, is that it's highly underreported. When somebody gets attacked very badly, uh, I hear about it because I'm doing the workshops and somebody always comes up to me at the end of the workshop. And I've, I've lectured to thousands of animal professionals around the world. And I've heard some horrific stories from groomers, daycare folks. They've been attacked, sent to, airlifted to the hospital, losing limbs. Um, and But nobody talks about it because why? Who wants to be the person that's like, I'm a professional with dogs, you know, whatever facet you're doing, but I got attacked. And I, so it makes you feel like, or people start saying, oh, you don't know what you're doing, or you're not a professional. How could you get attacked? And so nobody wants to talk about it. And so a lot of these really awful things are happening out there, but nobody's mentioning it. And the only time you really hear about really bad dog attacks is the mainstream media stuff, you know, child riding down the street on a bike, uh, child in a home kind of stuff, but you don't hear about this groomer or that daycare staff or that trainer was mauled because nobody talks about it. So I think it should be an absolutely mandatory thing. Everybody should have at least just the basic minimum of what to do if a dog attacks you. What are you going to do if you're in your van, your normal grooming van, and a dog, large German Shepherd, breaks their, you know, they whatever they're being secured with, and they come after you and they pop their muzzle off, and now they're attacking you, and you're by yourself in your in your van. Mm -hmm. That can end disastrously, of course. So I think just the bare minimum, because if you, here's another interesting statistic is that if you look at the number of injuries per capita, we have in the animal care industry, more injuries per capita, meaning more of us get injured than deep sea fishermen, coal miners, and lumberjacks. So we are in one of the most inju injurious professions in the world. We get bitten a lot, we get injured a lot, and we get pulled off our, you know, the injuries, not quite as bad as some of those professions, of course, but that says a lot about the safety practices we have in place, which is bare minimum right now. So um, yeah. we definitely need and, to be putting more in place. And and you're talking to someone who was attacked by a St. Bernard. Mm -hmm. And I am very glad that I was in a shop at the time 
and that I had places to run to and counters to hop over and, you know, and, and other people to help. And <clears throat> also fortunate that he stopped when, and, and I'll, 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 our listeners have heard the story before. I'm, I'll t- may tell you off air if you want to hear it, because it's kind of funny, but <laughs> you don't often hear that about dog attack stories, but yeah. he didn't want to go in the crate. So when that trigger stopped and I backed off to get away, he's like, oh, okay, I won. We're cool. Until somebody else tried to get him in a crate. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, yeah, he got, he got sent home wet. That was a come get your dog now. (laughs) Here's the other thing too, is sometimes owners are not honest with us. Yeah. Yeah. Has your dog ever bitten anyone? Mm -hmm. And you know what? I would specifically ask, has your dog ever bitten a groomer? Because- You'd be surprised Mm -hmm. at the number of people who think getting bit is part of the job as being a dog groomer. Oh, I've had people straight up tell me to my face because when I worked with corporate, we only had so much leeway with pricing, but I would charge, I called it a Band-Aid fee. I'd be like, here's an extra 20 bucks. Your dog made me bleed. And I've had people straight up in my face, eye contact. Well, isn't that your job? Like think about any other profession. Like imagine any other profession in the world, and we somebody gets injured. Oh, isn't it your job to get stuck by a needle from <clears throat> something's got an infectious disease? You say that to a doctor or a nurse. Yeah. Oh, isn't it your job to get you know burned by the fire to a firefighter? Like like imagine saying the same thing. It just it's mind boggling, but it it again just speaks of the volumes of the about the safety that needs to be in place. That really. Because I don't want to scare your listeners away either. <laughs> want no, to be like, oh my gosh, know, I'm gonna talk- get mauled. <laughs> oh, we so. we don't scare easy. You don't yeah. you don't become um, a groomer. But here's and- the thing is to consider is that we are in a profession again, and especially you guys, is that you're getting dogs that are gonna be in a higher state of stress often because they're in a different environment mm-hmm. than the client that's got the dog in the home and just cuddling with them on the couch. So you, as well as veterinarians, as well as trainers, as well as folks in the shelter, anybody working with an animal outside of their normal environment is getting a slightly different animal or a much different animal in many cases. Uh, and it's another consideration for safety. You're, you know, so you're already saying I'm walking into a hot environment. It's like a firefighter, like not receiving any training or not learning how to use a fire extinguisher. If you're going to get into that profession, of course, you're going to learn those things to stay safe. Um, so yeah, safety is just, it, it needs to be, because the, the sad thing for me is when I see professionals leave the whatever industry they're in because they got bitten or attacked and then they're just, they get what's called sinophobia, which is actually fear of dogs in some cases. Mm-hmm. And they can't work. They can never work again with animals. And that's, that's tough to see, you know. Cause I was, I was actually concerned because this was very early in my career. I wasn't even uh, a groomer then. I was, I was a bather and I was, I was a little concerned, but so far the worse it is, the, only real negative impact is um I can't watch Cujo because um no that's yeah that's what it looks like turn the channel now well, it's a no, terrible we're good movie, so <laughs> yeah no bad bad movie I understand. But, <laughs> all right and I have a question related to that and I will ask it after these messages and speaking of continuing education because we either were or will be join the Andes world-class education team each month for live interactive virtual classes. You'll learn new and trending styles, as well as tips and tricks from some of the best groomers in the industry. Whether you're looking for basic skills, trending styles, advanced techniques, or even just ways to spark your creativity, the new Andist Grooming Education site is your source for finding what you need to create your way for success. Try new techniques, learn from the pros, and grow your confidence today at andis.com backslash groomer education traveling groomer podcast listeners hey that's you can get 25 percent off your first course today with the code v-e-g-r-o-o-m-i-n-g at checkout on andis.com backslash groomer education okay so the question i have for you there's a super non-technical term that groomers use. And I want to know if trainers have an equivalent. (laughs) And I originally heard it specifically in relation to Roddy's, but this St. Bernard had it too, because I could have sworn I ran into him years later when he was a much older dog. 
but we call it like the fish eye or the stink eye. Ah, okay. And okay, so, all right, you know what I meant. You and and a dog can be fine mm-hmm. and never give me a real a behavior problem, but they give this, there's a specific side eye look. Mm-hmm. And whenever I get the look, I never trust the dog a hundred percent again. I go, there's something they're able to go off at something they don't like. I mean, every dog is able to go off. They all have sharp pointy teeth, but so you seem to know what I was talking about. Yeah. It's a classic signal that dogs give. It's called a half. It's either called a half moon eye or a whale eye. There's different terms like depend Mm -hmm. because it looks like a crescent. Uh, The white of the eye shows like a crescent because they're basically averting their gaze. Now here's the thing about, the direction of the eyes of dogs is that that for me is a slightly prefer it's not a good thing but it's a slightly preferable way of the dog to be looking than what's called a hard stare so the the, yes. the, the side eyes when they're trying to actually avoid and it's like saying hey you know i kind of don't want you doing what you're doing so i'm just going to try to avoid you right now and try to give you a little signal that says i don't want much to do with you so if, 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 you know, if you're just, if you're looking at everything else too, if you, you know, cause the rest of the body language often tells you a lot, you usually see a side eye with uh tongue flicks or the mouth being closed and the stiffening and, you know, uh, but not quite the point of I'm going to bite you right now. And that's, what's called the hard stare is that's when they're actually directly staring at you. Just like a person that's mad at you, mm-hmm. gives you the furrowed brow. They give you a hard look. They are staring directly at you, and they're basically their nose is, nose is pointed right at you, and usually the rest of their body too, if they're not constrained in any way, like a straight arrow towards you. That dog, you want to be that very stiff careful posture. With. That typically, yeah. yeah, they're about to, to to attack you and bite you, and typically those dogs can continue with a more sustained attack because dogs that are directly hard staring you, straight spine alignment, high flagging tail, that kind of posture, they mean business, um, but. The side eye dogs, I actually prefer seeing that over the hard stare, of course, because they're saying, uh, you know, I'm working here and trying to get you to stop what you're doing. So I'm going to keep trying that. And then if you keep doing, I might have to escalate to doing other things, growling, snarling, snapping, biting, all that stuff. But um, so side eye is a very classic. Some might also call it what's called a stress displacement or appeasement behavior, although mm-hmm. a couple of fancy terms for it. But all it is saying is that the dog is usually uncomfortable with what's going on at that moment. Now, do you also find that excessive licking or or kiss, mm-hmm. kissing kissing when they when they lick you mm-hmm. as as a form of appeasement behavior? That can be a couple things. Um, sometimes you taste good, so you can keep that in mind. So sometimes you just have something on you that that the dog's just tasting. Um, but consider the context. So if you're doing something to the dog and the dog starts listen, licking you, um, there's actually a great phrase. It's called "kiss to dismiss." It's the dog actually looking you to get you to stop doing what you're doing. It's typically more of a quick rapid succession, lick, 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 not a very excessive, like, lick, 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 it's not stopping. Um, that's more of a stress displacement behavior sometimes as well. And it can be a compulsive behavior in some dogs too, but it's uh, typically the one you want to watch out for is if the dog's giving you other stress signal, maybe the ears are pulled back a little bit, maybe they're licking their lip, their own lips, maybe they've got the side eye or the whale eye, and their tails may be a little down and tucked and those kind of signals. And then they also do the, I'm going to lick your hand while you come over to touch me. That one's deceiving to people because they, that's what gets people in trouble. It's they think that, oh, the dog loves me. They're kissing me. But that's yeah. actually the dog saying, I want you to move away. It's similar to what's called a tap out behavior when the dog rolls over onto their back and shows you their belly. Yes, mm-hmm. there's some dogs that are like, I love when you rub my belly. And you think of your classic golden retriever that loves people. But there's some dogs that are saying, uncle, they're like, I'm rolling over because I don't want you to touch me. And again, if you look at all the other signals, like yeah. you might see the side eye and their arms being drawn in, their tail tucked, that dog is actually saying, I don't want you to rub my belly, but I'm doing my best to avoid you. So um, there's those nuances, and right? It is. And you really have to speak dog. And I, and I know the the word dominance gets thrown around incorrectly, but you have to read it in context. So that's what you're talking about. Okay. There's a difference in rub my belly and yeah. uncle, uncle stop. Yeah. And if you, if they're saying uncle and you keep pushing it, mm-hmm. could you push that into, into aggression? Like, wow, I tried to deescalate. Then the dog's like, I tried to deescalate. 
I was polite about it and everything. Yep. And she kept touching my feet. Yep. Yeah. Some, and, and some dogs will escalate and some dogs will just say, ah, okay, just get it over with. Let's deal with it. Uh, and some dogs will go into what's even something called learned helplessness. That's where it's, they completely give up. They're saying, I can't do anything here. I'm completely defenseless. <clears throat> so I'm just going to give up and you can do what you want. And that's, a, that happens to humans as well, but it happens to some dogs. Um, and some dogs, uh, the, the nice thing about dogs is they tolerate us as humans so well. When you think about the billions of dogs on this planet and the number of bites that actually occur and the, the, the yeah. number of bites that result in serious injuries, which is so minuscule, the number as compared to the number of dogs, the humans are so much worse. <laughs> humans are so much more dangerous than dogs. So yeah. Dogs are very tolerant of what we're doing as humans. Um, and the, the, the amount of injuries they give us is it, like dog bites are sensational, right? Like people make a big deal about it, but it's so far and few between for a dog to actually injure a human. It's so rare. When yeah. I when I first started working with dogs and I left corporate America, I was like, this is wonderful because when mm -hmm. a dog bites me, I kind of know why. Mm -hmm. He tells me about it. I know why I did exactly. something. When a human bites your head off, who knows what the <laughs> yeah. hell? I'm like, what, where yeah. did that come right? from? It's, it's, not, it's so true. But, you know, dogs are just so lovely and transparent and they don't lie to you when they want when they're expressing their feelings. So that's why a lot of us gravitate towards dogs. I think that's why a lot of us gravitate towards dogs. So yeah. getting back to where can, do you have classes that you teach? Do you teach anything online or is it all in person? Uh, both. I do both in-person appearances, workshops and seminars, um, and also online uh, courses and webinars and things like that. So, All right. So if somebody wants to watch, well, they should be you know, taking more behavioral classes. How would they take some of your workshops? Um, everything's through aggressivedog.com. I, I, they, all, everything can be found there. I have the podcast information there, conference info, webinars, workshops, in-person stuff. So it's all kind of, that's the main portal to everything. And then it'll funnel you out to wherever you want to go. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Okay. Um, got questions, Chris? I, got I have food bear a here. list of questions that I haven't gotten to. I'm going to try to get back on track with commercials. I, I don't think we're, it's been a full 10 minutes yet, but I'm trying to get back on, on schedule. And I don't even know if I'm going to get to all my questions, but you know, let's don't see what be I'm going to buy next. Go ahead. Oh, oh, <laughs> I'm being You'll sold love a this bunch one. of stuff. Don't be, don't be shocked if Mary contacts you about this. <laughs> what if I told you, you could have a year's worth of online education for less than the cost of one in-person trade show. That's right. For only 97 a month, you have access to a different two-day educational conference with 10 hours of material taught by the best in the industry. Every month has a new theme that includes anything from grooming skills to business and everything in between. Can't catch it live or just want to rewatch it? Recordings are available for six weeks with closed captioning for both live and recordings with transcripts. What are you waiting for? Grab your membership today at positiveed.com. And and that is Mary's baby. Love so it. okay. Shut so up, okay. list of questions. Okay, wait, wait. Can I just do my last poo quick? Poo bear <laughs> yes. Okay, so this here is Pooh Bear. Okay. And Pooh Bear lifts my sweatshirt. And when he is with me, my husband can't walk in this room. This is that's just where the bursting out of the chest comes from. So if he's sitting in here and my uh -huh. husband comes into the office, he'll just rear out and you know attack from his little spot right here. But then if I'm not around, he cuddles up with him. Yep. Okay. So he was passed around quite a bit. He ended, he came from a little dog rescue based in Texas came up to New England. He went to my mother-in-law's house. And she didn't like him. He went to my sister-in-law's house temporarily till he came to ours. She was mean and had no taste. She was mean and had no taste. This was my dog right from the start. <laughs> all right. And he's been my dog since the second he laid eyes on me. All right. So I'm sure there's some, some psychology in there as to, you know, the first person who claimed him so therefore, I claim you. 
Yeah. I mean, dogs are going to build relationships a lot like people do. I mean, they're social animals, so they're going to find somebody they trust. And they, some dogs are only one person kind of dogs and some dogs have a family, but you know, I find that a lot of times the dog that a lot of times it's the person who actually brings the dog home first, you know, but then it can switch to mm-hmm. whoever is spending the most time and bonding with the dog. A lot of times it's whoever brings the dog home first. And then that dog might start guarding <laughs> that person from the other people in the home, like your husband mm-hmm. or whoever, everybody tries to come over and say, hello. The dog yeah, starts growling call at the them. chaperone. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just, it's very similar to what's called resource guarding. Like when a dog values something, they're going to protect it, whether it's you or a bone or food or the property or anything they find a value. The, the term is called resource guarding. They're guarding something that they like. And that is normal behavior for people too. So, you know, when I see a dog doing that, I understand it. Of course, it's not, the partner doesn't always understand it, but uh, it's something that you can fix. You know, you have to build relationships with the other people in the family as well and do things where the dog feels safe about that person approaching. So uh, not uncommon. Yeah. And also nice at the same time. (laughs) You know what it is? It's real. It is nice. I was not the first person. I was probably like fifth or sixth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I'm not around or I'm busy and I'm just not there, he will cuddle up with my husband. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. He's cheating on you a little bit, but (laughs) (laughs) he's, uh, but yeah, that it's, so that's an interesting thing too. If you go to like countries where there's a lot of um, free roaming or dogs that that are living on the streets, you'll see the same phenomenon. They're going to latch onto the person that's feeding them something off the table at the restaurant as a tourist. They'll hang around with that person all day. That person goes back home and then there's the next person and they develop a relationship with that person. But they tend to always have that one person they go back to. They like, all right, I'm going to work the tourist today. That's going to be my person. <laughs> and I'm going to guard that person from the other dogs. And then I'm going to go home to my real person and sleep on their doorstep or whatever. And then I'm going to go back out the next day. It's it's really cool to see how dogs are so adept at building relationships quickly um, and learning who they can trust. Because that's really yeah. the operative word is trust. It's they, they're going to go with who they trust, who they feel safe with and who provides resources. And, and um, yeah. Yeah. We, we had a chihuahua that was like that. And when we went to pick him up, my husband was the first person. And he, and it, I have this picture of him holding him like on his back, like a baby. And it was love at first sight. And he, the dog liked me enough, but if my husband was around, I was absolutely chopped liver. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I would come home and know where my husband was because the dog would be pointing at the door mm-hmm. and standing. I'm like, oh, he's in the bathroom or he's upstairs or he's there. But yeah, they yeah, latch I'm, on. And Chihuahua too. He was my husband's dog. My husband got the happy dance when he came home. I did not get the happy dance. <laughs> my husband got the happy dance. I got, oh, okay, you're home. All right, whatever. Nice to see you. <laughs> and that that leads me to to one of the questions on my list. And one of the things I really loved hearing in some of the podcasts was the acknowledgement that dogs are emotional beings, that they feel things. And I, I was actually told once by a human psychologist, and I really try not to let this person around my my loved one, that, oh, these people, and he was talking about people who were technically in his care, who were some level of of mentally disabled. Oh, they're like dogs. They don't understand. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. first of all, that's my nephew you're talking about. And second of all, you moron, dogs understand. Like they know things because it's something groomers have been noticing for a while where a dog comes in and they're just not acting the same. They're having a bad dog day as I heard. And we were like, did, are they okay? They didn't seem to be any pain, but they seemed off. Did anything happen in the house? And we'll get, there's a divorce. The kid moved to college. Somebody, a family member passed. They understand to and they have their emotions too. They just process it differently. So I think people don't always read that. They don't. They often, well, 
I don't blame the people really because they're often going through their own struggles and their own stressors that are being fed to the dog in a way, in a roundabout way. But Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's hard to see that in a dog if you're, especially if you're not paying attention to it. And, um, you know, dogs are so good at responding and, and observing not what we say, but what we do and how we do it. So they're paying attention to the micro expressions. They can read our faces and expressions way better than the next human, because that's what they're paying attention to. Not so much what we're saying, like, yeah, we can say the magic words like walk or, you know, car ride or whatever, but those are cues in the environment. Basically it says that something's about to happen. So same thing can happen with our facial expression, because that's how they're reading us all day long is our expressions, our movements, our demeanor, you know, everything that we're doing, the movements we make when we come in the house, come home from work, they know if we're angry or upset or what the potential next actions could be us stomping down or slamming something, which then, you know, changes how they're feeling. So that's really what they're feeding into is all of the, what we're doing. They may not understand that, you know, they, we got yelled out at work or something like that, or we didn't get the raise we wanted. They don't know that but they see our expressions. They see how we're acting. They're seeing our demeanor. And so that's so, so crucial to think about because dogs can have bad days because we're having bad days because they see what we're doing and they don't know. It's confusing for them too. When you think about it, they're like, I don't know. Why is, why are they so upset? They don't know what happened at work and we can't explain to them either. Right. They're just seeing our expressions. So that's, uh, that's sort of the classic guilty dog thing too. You know, like when people say, oh, my dog knew they did bad. Your dog has no idea. They don't have a moral character. They were going in the garbage and getting in the garbage. They don't know they did bad. They had a great day. <laughs> it's just you're coming home with an expression of like anger or upset because okay. they're seeing right. your right. face. So then if the dog looks guilty, right? Because they're just throwing appeasement gestures. They're not actually guilty. All right. So explain this one for me. Okay. Mm-hmm. Six dogs in my house. I come home one day. Ricky is a puppy. He's maybe four months old at the time. Golden retriever. Golden Mm -hmm. retriever. And he chewed up a pillow. It was a pillow for my mother-in-law, so I didn't care. (laughs) But anyway, so I come home and there is two two groupings of dogs. There's the blob of five Uh dogs. They're all five dogs all together and they're moving as a unit. Mm -hmm. And then there's Ricky. And Ricky's trying to join the blob and the blob will not allow him to join the blob. Okay. Um, And they're all looking at Ricky. Yeah. Okay. So they're like, yeah, he chewed up the pillow, not us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So explain that scenario to me. Has anything else ever been chewed up in your home? Oh, I five had six dogs and a puppy in the house Uh at one time. Yeah. Things get chewed up in my house. You. How do you usually get, do you get upset about saying something chewed up like couch cushion, pair of pajamas or something? I probably, that's if I'm thinking, well, for that pillow, I was like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate but that. in the past, in the past, but you've been probably, things, I'm probably a little annoyed over it. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. So I know they did not want to get blamed for it. Yeah. That's here's, the, here's the cool thing about dogs is they're really good about creating associations with things in the environment. So your other dogs have learned that when something gets torn up, it's not a Mommy good thing. Mommy gets mad. Yeah, Mommy. could get mad, could get mad. So could. there's a little, maybe they're like probably wondering, oh, that wasn't so bad that time. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's the pairing of the event that says, okay, torn up pillow or torn up object of any kind. Sometimes could be one dog being involved with that, but that is the predictor of a negative event, meaning you're upset. They don't know. It's because, let's think about it. Like, what's the difference between like a stuffed toy that you bring home from the store that they can tear up and a pillow that all the stuffing comes out? Let's say it's the same exact stuffing too. They don't know the difference, but your expression tells them what the difference is. When you get home, you're like, that's my pillow or that's your toy. Looks like you guys had fun. You have different expressions. They feed off that. They Then they remember. It's like, okay, when this particular type of item gets torn up, it's a bad thing because mom will be upset. And so it's just the the pairing. And and, and if you look at so many other things in dog's life that don't make sense to us as humans, it starts to really make sense. Because like, what about garbage cans? You have some dogs that go outside and it's like garbage day and they're completely frightened of it. They don't want to go outside. They see the garbage cans to us. We're like, well, what's the problem? It's just garbage cans. It's because maybe one day one fell over on a windy day or a garbage truck came by and was like slamming a garbage can. 
that forever then is like garbage cans aren't safe. They bring, predict bad things could happen. So I'm not going to go near a garbage can. So that's the weird things dogs do. <laughs> like okay. they do these, these association about what's potentially safe and what's icky or not. And, uh, and it goes from there. <laughs> All right, Chris, you got more questions? Uh, oh, yes. I'm going to, I'm going to slip this one in before our last commercial break, because it's a little, it's a little dark and I want to lighten it up before we, we go. Good, so good call. Okay. in one of the episodes I was listening to, they were talking about trainers who actively talk owners into putting dogs down mm -hmm. because the, the aggression issues are so bad. And my, my only experience with that is I had a dog come in with, for a nail trim once and the dog was muzzled and I've never had this happen with any other dog, but he wanted to kill me so badly Mm -hmm. He grabbed my arm with his paw and dragged it. Not that he couldn't actively bite me, but I had big scratches on my arm because he really, 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 really wanted to get me. And there was something a little off in his look and did the nail trim. Whew, we made it. We're alive. Good. That needed to be done. Send him away. And the corporate salon I worked at at the time was right next to a, a supermarket chain and I ran into her like three or four months later and she's like, oh, we had to put the dog down. And, and I went, was he randomly attacking family members for like no apparent reason, like waking up at it? And she was like, yeah. And all I could do was tell her that I, I, I cause I wasn't about to tell her you should have done this, this, and this, and this, because I kind of knew that it wasn't right. And I believe that if people can be mentally ill and have chemical imbalances in their brains, then dogs can too. But I'd never heard of, and I could just reassure her that she didn't do anything horrible, but I'd never heard of trainers being adamant about, you really need to put this dog down because it will do X, Y, Z when there's not mm -hmm. a serious attack history before. So is that, is that something that happens? Cause how it, do you predict that? Yeah, it, it can. So if we're talking about, you know, dogs without any kind of bite history and they're just showing yeah. some minimal signs of aggression, uh, it can happen because for everybody, it's it's about their experience around dogs, you know. So if you go, and I'll use other countries as an example, you might go to like Norway and, you know, look at the dog culture, look at the behavior of dogs. You could work as a trainer there for years. You may not ever see a bite, ever, because they're, number one, they have great, um, you know, policies around giving dogs freedom and socialization, but they're also getting good dogs and they're also not tolerating aggression. So you might have somebody in their little microculture of saying, I don't tolerate aggression. I can't have a biting dog. This is not safe. This is dangerous. So I never blame the, the person. Um, I try to give them some knowledge about how to make these decisions and look at some objective factors. But I think it's important to look at, uh, understand that person's own unique culture of dogs, because everybody has a different viewpoint. And regardless of who you ask, I could take the same dog and say, okay, this is what the dog is doing. This is the size of the dog, the breed of the dog, the age of the dog, the health of the dog, the issues, and give it from one trainer to the next. And I can go through a hundred trainers and you're going to get a hundred different answers about what they think the outcome should be. So for me, it's never telling a client. I never say to a client, you need to euthanize your dog or you need to do this or that. It's their dog. It's their decision. What I do though, is educate them on all the variables that they should consider on making that kind of decision. So, you know, there, I actually have 18 different things I look at with clients. I don't go through all of them, but I, I touch base on the, the most important ones, such as the size of the dog. Is it a 140 pound Rottweiler or a 10 yeah. pound Chihuahua? One, which one could do more damage? Uh, is it, I look at the bite levels. Like, has this dog mauled somebody before? Is it just air snapping at people and it's done it a hundred times? So it's being super safe about its biting. Um, is it a uh, dog that has lots of health issues that need to be addressed? That's going to take more time and more money. Are those health issues contributing to the aggressive behavior? 
Does the client have the time and the resources? Do they live in an environment where it's tough to manage? Do they have like five kids and the dog's biting kids? That's a totally different case than somebody else. Do they live in a open gate beach community where there's plenty of tons of people in and out and it's very hard to manage the dog? Um, those are just a few of the variables. And so what I do is help my clients understand all of those things to look at for their own case, and then they can make their own decision. Uh, and sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward, like a dog has literally mauled somebody or put somebody in the hospital several times. Like that's a dangerous case. And then you yeah. have some that are also on the other end. Dogs, you explain to them, your dog's air snapped 150 times and has never made contact. And it's only because the kids are throwing rocks at it or something ridiculous like that. Like it's so obvious that that dog is not dangerous. So you have those kind of ends of the spectrum, but sometimes it falls in the middle. You know, you have dogs that are biting and it can be in multiple circumstances it's over food. It's at the groomers, it's at the vet. It's when uncle Bob comes over, you know, all of those scenarios can make it more difficult to decide what to happen. But again, it's, it's up to the person or the rescue or the shelter, whoever, whoever has ownership of the dog. Right. I, uh, I have another scenario. Just wanted to get, get your opinion on this. I yeah. have a friend who does Corgi rescue mm -hmm. and she had a Corgi that she could not adopt out. It had, it, it had some brain issues and it would just go off and snap mm -hmm. and, and really go at you. And she was so stressed and so high strung and what she wound up doing was she took it to the vet and said, okay, we're going to pull all her teeth. Mm. And yeah, the vet examined and with that's a little extrange, the vet examined him and went, cause she came in when, with a Hannibal Lecter muzzle on and the vet tried to examine her and she went. <laughs> yeah. And then he went, okay, so we're going to, we're going to do that. And being on the receiving end of one of her gummings, I can't imagine because I was just standing mm -hmm. there and had flip flops on, and all of a sudden I'm like, "Oh, Bridget is um like at my foot, just," yeah. and I was nowhere near her. Mm -hmm. I was standing over here. She walked up to me. Something in her brain went, Bleh, and she, you know. But then if you went banana, she'd go. What? And then give her a piece of banana and she'd be like, she'd go away and calm down. But it was the anxiety level was so high for whatever she had been through. Anything could be a perceived threat. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, that, that term, it, it's called dearming or defanging is a, another yeah. old term for that. It's when they remove the teeth, which I don't believe in because I think it's. It's akin to like, it, it, like the punishment just doesn't fit the crime for me. It, you know, it's like not saying somebody just shoplifted here and we're going to cut off their arms, right? And said, mm -hmm. so you never do that again. Yeah, maybe it'll stop, but it doesn't, you know, let's say that person's doing it because they're trying to feed their family, right? It's never going to, it's not going to actually solve the problem. It's yeah. not going to help the dog feel any better. In fact, it can make the field dog, the dog feel much worse, right? It's, it's sort of like when people, um, declaw their cats right? i was just about to say like declawing cats makes them more likely to bite yeah it just it's not a nice thing to do right and mm -hmm. it's such an extreme measure to to solve what usually can be fixed in other ways right so um you know obviously not all aggression behavior or aggressive behavior can be addressed but most of the time it can uh, without having to remove body parts of the dog so uh yeah it's yeah i'm not a not a fan of that but um but again I'm empathetic to why somebody would do that. You know, I can understand that um, you want to save the dog. You know, you don't, you don't want to consider the alternative and uh, but you do have to consider the dog's quality of life. You know, if, if how much they're going to be doing okay, if they don't have their teeth, like a major tool for a dog, mm -hmm. when you think about how, how much they use their mouth to do things, it's like removing a big part of that dog. So considerations. All right. So we're going to take our very last commercial break. This one's just 30 seconds, I promise. And uh, we'll wrap up on a lighter note because that right. was that that was scary. And I got to remember where my buttons are. There we go. I know As when I'm on the road grooming, grooming the I want to keep things As a going along. Groomer. 
I know when I'm on the van and generator, I want to keep things rolling along one for with a nine foot clearance. But hand van engineering and design van has been actually mobile through both drive to Well, now I know what happens when you press two buttons at once. That sounded like two of you. Chris and Stary. Got it fixed, Chris? So this is why yeah, I muted because my um my fingers hit two buttons at once and now I know that they will play simultaneously. So good to know. Uh my apologies to Hanby, and I believe it was actually Ashley Hanby who told me to <laughs> get you on as a guest, Mike. So um check out Hanby Engineering <laughs> because they do more than just vans and have great stuff. And sorry about that technical difficulty there no worries well that was fun so one of the the questions i had down was what question were you dreading like is there a question you get asked a lot or is there a question either coming from a groomer or another podcast or podcaster that you're like i'm and you're gonna I'm make him answer that question gonna be that's asked. a great question Actually, this, like another one I've never been asked. Um, no. I I think the typical one in the training uh, world is questions about tools, like you know, because there's just I'm sure you guys experience the same, like different camps that like focus on mm -hmm. different techniques and ways of approaching grooming. Same thing in the dog training world. So you guys are not alone out there in social media and all the arguments I'm sure you have in your groups. Uh, everybody's mm -hmm. got something to disagree about. So the same thing can happen in the dog training world with different training tools and things like that. So that's typically the question, but I've gotten it so many times, you know, I, I, I love like if I was going to answer questions for the rest of my life, I could do that strictly because I love Q and a and talking and conversations like All this. Right. Yeah. So was that ask you about clicker training or don't ask you about clicker training? <laughs> like I said, you can ask me anything you want. It's your show. <laughs> well, is there anything that you would want a groomer to know because there's some things groomers want trainers to know, but is there anything you would want a groomer uh, to know regarding training and regarding dealing with aggressive dogs, especially since we either have in our head that we have to do this or yeah. for the dog's health, we have to do this. So yeah. how to get them through, they're telling us they're unhappy, but we kind of, mm -hmm. <sighs> Yep. Their nails are throwing up gang signs and affecting their game. It's got to get done. I, th I think you guys are in a similar position as veterinarians. There's things you have to get done. Like there's the, you, you're bringing the dog in. There's You can't just be like, oh, we're going to take this slow process and get your dog used to it over 20 visits. It doesn't make sense, you know, financially, time-wise, dog-wise. Like there's just, it's difficult. And so my, my, top wish list, whether it's veterinarians, groomers, trainers, or anybody I'm talking to is just talk to the other people so we can all work together as a team. Because if I'm going, to, I can say all the things I want to a client and be like, all right, this is what you're going to do. Cooperative care. You're going to teach the dog chin rest. And then they're going to sit here lovely for the groomer and do a chin rest and so they can do the ears and all this other stuff. But if I'm not communicating with the groomer, that's not going to, that's going to completely fall apart. And if the groomer's like, what is this? cooperative chin rest what no let's come over here and so there's no communication that's where the breakdown happens and it doesn't help yeah. the dogs so for me i would love more collaboration between trainers and groomers and veterinarians oh, and shelters and just like, get everybody talking more about what we're doing because like me i know next to nothing about grooming and there's so much i can learn from you guys and other people i talk to and that's that's just so helpful to help the dogs in the long run. And just to get back to what you were saying about like, there's, you know, there's times when you have to get things done. So some trainers don't recognize that. We're like, oh no, you can totally give the dog break. Sure, there's some leeway on a lot of things. Maybe we don't need to do certain things on a certain day. We can wait till the next time. We can get the dog more comfortable, uh, more acclimate, you know, acclimated to the grooming environment, wherever it is. Uh, but there are some things that need to be done. We recognize that, not, but not everybody does yet. And that's a, that's the balance there, yeah. right? It's, it's yeah. like saying, ah, I, you know, because we have a, there's a tendency to be like, oh, that trainer doesn't know what they're talking about. We got to get this done. And then that groomer doesn't know what they're doing because we got to take our time with this. 
and so we in can a find perfect, that balance. Yeah. And in a perfect world, we can communicate with our clients yeah. and get them on regular schedules and get them yeah. in as puppies as early as humanly possible yes. so yes. that we can, so that it's not as big an issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I love seeing that too, by the way, I love seeing yeah. that the trainers are getting, focusing more on getting dogs, puppies uh, ready for yeah. groomering, grooming visits and veterinary visits. Um, I, I love that that's happening more so than let's teach them all how to sit down, stay, come and walk nicely on the leash, which can help, but it, it's not going to help the dog at all in a grooming setting. Right. Um, uh, maybe it's stay, <laughs> but that's about it for right? like in terms of what we typically would teach as trainers in the past. So, you know, that all those collaborations go such a long way because we share, like, I've learned so many amazing tips for handling and defensive handling from groomers, from veterinarians, from shelter staff. And if we work together, then the trainers can be like, Hey, check out this new distraction technique or this chin rest behavior to the grooming world. And you combine those things, guess what? That dog is having going from having a lousy time to having a great time because you got all these people invested in helping them feel comfortable. And that's what we yeah. really want for all the dogs. We want them to feel like they're having a good time going to these things. They should look forward to the groomer. They should look forward to the vet. They should look forward to hanging out with the trainer, not any of the opposite, right? And we can, we can get that going at an early age in the puppies and get that word out to everybody. You know, then you guys won't get bitten anymore <laughs> then that, we get nobody nice. bitten anymore you know that's what i'm going for you know that's what i hope just keeps continuing in our world all right mary i had a i had something marked down for if time and we're already over time but we touched on it so i'm going there so <laughs> there was there was something floating around uh facebook and the grooming groups for a while now i think it started like a year or so more ago Oh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding consent yeah. grooming. Yep. Uh -huh. Consent grooming. And we all laughed our asses off at it. I'll be perfectly frank. And then I uh, took a class from another groomer who's who does training and behavior, Chrissy Newmeyer Smith. And she was talking about and, and explaining things and breaking it down. And she broke my brain because I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. And she's talking about the dogs. We want them to be calm, comfortable, and cooperative. And we want them. And I'm like, she's talking about consent grooming, but she's not saying it like that. So we understand it and it doesn't sound crazy. So that's what, like about the chin rest. Mm-hmm. Because as things change, when I was taught to groom, we would just hold them by their hair on their chinny chin chin. Mm -hmm. And we could control where their head went and we could feel it if they started moving. Because a lot of times we have sharp things right here by their eyeballs. A lot of times we mm -hmm. have sharp things by their eyeballs. But it a lot of dogs don't like it. Mm -hmm. And it's also quote unquote, good place to hold because they can't necessarily bite you from there, but they don't like it. So we're learning alternate things. And I'm like, oh, that's more consent and holding it, holding the muzzles different ways and going into the pressure points. So have you, have you heard that? Have you heard the phrase consent grooming? And does it sound as crazy to you as it did to us back when we first heard it? You know, interesting enough, you say it, and when I first heard it, I was like, huh, oh, that's gonna probably cause some controversy. Because oh, yeah. when you mm -hmm. when you talk oh, yeah. about consent, we're talking about other things in the human world. And I won't get into it, that subject, right. but that is we have to be careful what terms we use. It's kind of like the terms trauma or abuse or yeah. punishment. Like there's a lot of different interpretations of that depending on it. And you have to be careful because when somebody's experienced any of those things in their life. That can discount also when we're talking about, oh, now we're going to use it with animals or dogs or parrots. And like, it can be, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be careful with words. So I, I totally get it. When I heard that, I was like, oh, some people are going to get a little bit upset with that, but I get the premise and I like that, that that's what they're going for. Uh, just the, the terminology is a little bit, you know, tough for people to swallow at first, but I love the concept of it because it helps I think it's one of the actually best things that's helping for dogs in the last 10 years because it really changes the conversation around, hey, 
can we get these dogs to actually be like, I like what you're doing when the whole time it's always assumed, oh, dogs don't like the vets, dogs don't like the groomers, dogs don't like this or that and that. Why can't we just think the opposite? Like, what if dogs actually like this stuff and we help them like this stuff with what we're doing? We change the conversation between the groomer or the vet and the dog or whoever's working with the dog. And that dog, dog learns how to communicate. And the person that's working with dogs like, loving it because yeah. the dog's happy and the dog's not going to bite them and even with like you were talking about like holding certain areas same thing you know is we can teach the dog like hey sometimes i am going to grab your collar or hold you here or do something but it's always going to have a positive outcome and you always have a choice in the matter yeah. and when that happens it really changes things because because really the number one reason dogs display aggression is because they're not feeling safe and they're often not feeling safe because we're restricting their movement. We're restricting their options. We're restricting their behavior right. through constraint or control or leash or grasping, whatever it is. That's where a lot of aggression cases occur. So if we give them the choice to be like, hey, I can move out here if I want. I'll come back because I do kind of like this game, but I need a break. So imagine that you're going to completely yeah. eliminate the aggression in that context. So and see, and I don't know why I, it's the term. It was the word consent that mm -hmm. I knew was going to be a problem. Yeah. But when I first learned how to groom cats, okay, that is precisely how I started to groom cats because I didn't have anyone telling me that we don't do it this way. Mm -hmm. I worked, found that working with the cat instead yeah. of the cat will do what I want the cat to do, that it worked so much better for me. Just listening and working with the cat yeah so that and, was consent grooming back 20 years ago yeah right and terminology can change like mary what do you call this mike what would you call this that's a loop grooming loop i it's would a call it a leash <laughs> a yes in my world in your world it would be a really really short mm -hmm. short leash yeah in the grooming world this is a loop when i started grooming you know what the common term for it was? A noose. Ugh. Right? So, oh, I'm going to put your dog in a noose. What? No, you're not. But it's, and this goes around their neck. This hooks up to the mm -hmm. arm. So, you know, to keep them secure on yeah. the table. So. Well, I'm glad we've gotten that away from that word. That's uh, yeah. a terrible thing. Yeah. yeah. So I think we, we can get hung up on terminology because this mm -hmm. is not a bad tool. This is a safety tool. But when you call it a noose, mm -hmm. not exactly a good thing. But oh, we a hundred percent went over time, and I am I am cool with it. Uh, Mary, do you have any more questions, or, no, or Mike, I do you have any questions for us? No, well, not right now, but I'm probably a million. <laughs> I'm learning a lot as I'm talking to you guys. So I appreciate your time as well. No problem. And, and you've got my email. You can contact us. We're always here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary? Yeah. No, same thing. Oh, okay. Well, awesome. Well, once we start re stop recording, um, we're probably going to talk for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. All righty. So thank you for coming on. This will be our first episode of the new year, which is super exciting. So we're going to start off all kinds of fresh with learning new things. And guys, thank you for listening along and safe travels. Well, that was fun, but now it's time to head home. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed chatting with you. If there are any topics you'd like us to discuss or guests you want to see join us on this crazy road trip of ours, let us know in the Traveling Groomers Facebook page. Don't forget to thank our sponsors. And see you next week, guys. Safe travels. <laughs>